I invite you to take note of the faith verse that's in your worship folder. This is an opportunity for you to carry on the dialogue that takes place here on Sunday morning. There are scriptures that are related to our theme for today. There's also questions that can be used for your prayer reflection, or if you are a part of a small group, you might utilize those to get your discussion moving. I also want to put a plug in for our meet and greet today. That's at 2 o'clock, and if you come at 2 o'clock, I promise to have you out by 3.15. Uh, this has been a great experience for us. We're learning all kinds of neat things about people. I discovered last Sunday that we have a group that's called the Last Row Ladies. Can you wave at me, Last Row Ladies? Hello there. Did you know we had a Last Row Ladies? What are you doing in there? You're the wrong gender in case you didn't know. Uh, okay, all right. But anyway, it's been a great opportunity for us to get to know people and to know their families. Now, last Sunday we had pretty good luck with the icebreaker activity, and so we're going to try that again. I'm going to ask you to take 30 seconds, find somebody you don't know all that well, and this time share your favorite Bible verse or chapter or book of the Bible. And, and I know that not all good church people read their Bibles a lot. Some of us just aren't readers. That's okay. So if that's the case, then simply share maybe a, a favorite quote that you have or a saying your parents used to always say when you were growing up. Share that instead. Okay? So please take 30 seconds and quickly share with someone you don't know all that well. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. I appreciate you getting the spirit of this. And hopefully because of this series, not only do you get to know me a little better, but we get to know one another a little better, and so our fellowship will be stronger. You might notice there's a little method to my madness with this sermon series, as you are learning a little bit about me, you're also discovering what I hope our church will be about and be even more about. Our first Sunday, we share the foot washing of Jesus with the disciples because I hope that we will be even more a serving church than we already are. Last Sunday, we talked about the need to share our faith with one another. And I hope that especially when we live in a world where people just don't show up on our doorstep, like they used to, that we learn to take the faith out into our world. And of course, today you're going to discover, as you learn my favorite Bible verse, chapter, and book, that we need to make sure we keep the scriptures a sacred part of our church life because there are so many people that have not discovered the power that is found within it. So I hope that you grasp that as we move forward. Now, let me begin with a story. The story is about two farmers, and these farmers, their land was right adjacent to one another, and farmer Bob, unfortunately, seemed to make always the wrong decision. When he chooses to put in soybeans as the majority crop, it seems like those prices plummet and corn goes up. Whenever he's taking grain to the market, he always seems to pick the wrong day to take it, and the price goes up the next day. Farmer Bill, though, seems to always be making the right decision each time. And it's evident how those decisions have paid off as, as the, his farm is certainly much better shape and improved than, than Farmer Bob. Well, Bob kept noticing that. And so one day they were both out in the field and, and Bob looked over and, and called out to Bill and, and they came to the fence row. 
And Bob said, I've noticed it seems like you just seem to always make the right choices at the right time. And I'm wondering how you do it. And Farmer Bill said, well, it's quite simple. I get up every morning and I pull out my Bible and I randomly open it to some book in the Bible. And then I close my eyes and I point my finger down and whatever that verse says, that's what I do. You should give it a try. So Farmer Boss says, sure, I can do that. And so the next day, he gets up, and he goes, finds his Bible. He had to blow a little dust off of it. And he opens in some random book in the Bible, and he closes his eye, and he puts his finger down, and he opens it up, and it says, chapter 11. <laughs> Would you explain that to the people next to you that are not laughing? Yeah. Oh, now I get it. Okay, here we go. All right, we're a little slow this morning. I've noticed that that's okay. Well, I have to confess that as much as we should laugh at that approach to the Bible, that in my early days of reading the Bible when I was in high school, that's exactly how I started. Because I didn't know much about the Bible. Nobody taught me anything. It really wasn't a big part of our church. And so I started reading my Bible, and I didn't know anything. And so... I would just open it up and see what God had for me. And you know, amazingly, it seemed like more often than not, I got blessed by that. Maybe just because there's so much good stuff in here that I had a pretty good uh, percentage chance of finding something helpful. But I would recommend that you not do this in the long term. <clears throat> if you're going to be serious about the scriptures and having them change and influence your life, you might want to get a little bit more involved. Because you'll discover that this is not just one book. It's a book of books, 66 books to be exact. It's written by different authors in different times and to different audiences and so different situations. And if you know those, you can gain so much more for what that might mean to you. I also discovered the more I became serious about my scriptures that it sometimes is a benefit not to take everything literally because sometimes there's a deeper meaning to be found when you treat it in a different way. And so it's been very important to discover the history, the background, the historical context that's behind whatever book you're reading. That's why Disciple Bible Study is such a great thing to do. If you can find the time, you'll gain so much by pouring into the passages and discovering its background, its history, what the author's trying to do and accomplish. Because you'll learn things, like the fact that there's actually, in the Old Testament, two creation stories instead of just one. And that impacts the way you deal with faith and silence, science. You'll discover that the first five books of the Old Testament we call the Torah actually has four strands of history within it. We call it the J, E, P, and D sources. And those have been woven together. And when you can somehow sort those out a little bit, you get a little better understanding of the times and the meaning that's found because it reflects the Israelite community at those different times in history. You also discover that the Psalms, while some want to claim that David, King David wrote all of them, most likely he wrote some of them, but many were commissioned in his name and credited it to him. But they come from different people and sometimes from different times. And you'd also discover that the book of Job is probably best understood as a poetic story instead of a historical story because it doesn't have the typical historical markers that the rest of Israelite history has. And, and then you can turn to the New Testament and you'll discover that Matthew and Luke had a copy of the Gospel of Mark in front of them when they wrote their Gospels. And you'd also benefit from the knowledge that you're reading Paul's letters to the Corinthians that Corinth was a sailor town. And that impacted what he was writing to. Or if you read the book of Romans, which sometimes gets a little complicated theologically, Paul's deepest theological work, it helps to know that Paul is dealing with a situation where the Jewish Christian leaders were in conflict sometimes with the Gentile Christian leaders. And so that explains some of the arguments he makes that just goes over our head because it doesn't speak to our day or time. All those things are so helpful. Michael Novelli has 
has shared some very helpful things. He says, you know, the Bible is 75% narrative or story. And in these stories, he says, we need to understand that they, they didn't write them like people write today. They were stories that were passed on from gener generation to generation, bringing their understanding of God in their time and place and trying to convey that to others. He points out that, that many risked their lives to make sure these stories were passed on and passed down unto us. And so it's, it's helpful to realize that, that it's written in a different way, that these stories sometimes don't reflect our modern understanding. These were not written by left brain scientists. They're written by people of faith to convey faith. And as they communicate to us, we discover sometimes that it's so helpful to realize that, that their world was seen differently than ours. In their world, the world was flat. When they shared the story of Noah and the flood, they thought the world was much smaller than we know it to be today. And so I'm not trying to say that we're claiming the Bible's inaccurate. We're just trying to put it into the proper context and see the words they're trying to share with us from their worldview in order for us to find the relevant truth for it to speak to ours. Let me just give you just one really good example where it makes such a difference to know the historical context. How many of you remember those words Jesus shared on the cross when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you always wonder what that means. And even from my youth, I've heard a preacher and many teachers who would say, well, it was at that moment that Jesus took on the entire sin of the world. And because God cannot look upon sin, he looked away for just a, a split second, which explains those words of despair by Jesus. I don't know about you, but that explanation, even when I was a kid, just didn't quite register. I mean, God can't look on sin. He looks on me all the time, and I believe me, I, I am definitely a sinner. And to think that Jesus, who so, showed so much courage in so many places, who wasn't afraid to confront the Pharisees and scribes and the religious leaders, who was silent through his beating that almost caused his death, who went through that trial and didn't stand up for himself. These just don't sound like words of Jesus. Well, now we know, not just through our scholarship of the Bible, but also through our understanding of Jewish history, that it was typical in the synagogue that whenever they would lead worship, because people had the Psalms memorized, because they knew them from heart, that the speaker would state the first verse of a psalm and everyone would know that he was intending the entire psalm and they could just keep on moving. Jesus on the cross, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You realize that comes from Psalm 22 and it happens to be the first verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from my words of groaning? So what Jesus is doing is, is not just sharing the pain that he's experiencing. He's being the human person that he is by reflecting the pain that he's gone through. But in addition, he's modeling the faith for us. Because if you'd read the rest of that psalm, you'd discover it is a typical Jewish lament that begins sharing the gripes, the complaints, the agonies of the Jewish people, but it moves to a statement of declaring that God is still in control. And so your faith will be maintained. And so God wasn't abandoning Jesus. He was allowing him to use the scripture that he had memorized that was a part of who he was to give him the strength he needed to endure those last three moments of his life. Now I invite you, as you read the scriptures, to be smart about how you do it. I recommend you don't start at the beginning and read all the way through. How many of you tried that? Yeah. You get stuck about Leviticus, don't you? Yeah, all those Jewish laws, kind of after a while, just start wearing on you, and it's easy to get bogged down and just give up. So don't do that. I recommend you start just getting a devotional. Just, just get into a few verses. Discover some of the gems of the Scripture. That will whet your appetite. 
And then I recommend that you go to one of the Gospels. Read Mark or read John. Because Jesus is what it's all about. Everything else leads up to it and follows thereafter. And then go to the book of Genesis because there's wonderful archetype stories that is the foundation of the New Testament. Then come back to a gospel and then you can dive into other parts of the scriptures. And when you do so, I invite you to get involved in a Bible study. I've discovered that reading the Bible is kind of like exercise, isn't it? You know you ought to do it. But getting yourself there is the hardest part. And as much as I believe in what I'm doing right now and, and what I hope to do every Sunday as I share the background of things, there is so much that can be learned by lay people just getting together and reading the scriptures together. You can learn so much from one another, and God will bless that effort if you just get into the scriptures. It is the best way that he speaks to us. But when you do so, I invite you to always try to see the big picture to realize that everything you're reading fits into a larger story of God. Michael Novelli likes to call it the sacred story. He suggests to us that some people like to read the book, the, the Bible, like a history book. And he says it has history, but it's so much more than that. And some people like to read it as an instruction manual. And there are some instructions, but it's so much more than that. And, of course, there's some people out there that just dismiss it as a bunch of fantasy. It's pure fiction, but there's too much verifiable history for that to be a logical conclusion. What he says is the best way to approach Scripture is to approach it as sacred story. To realize that these stories have been given to us, and in them are found the truth that we need, that God desires for us. And discover that sacred story so that it can intersect with your story is the best way for it to shape who God wants you to be. And when you connect it with that bigger picture, you then realize that God has got a purpose going all the way through. Philip Yancey is one of my favorite Christian authors. He actually began as a non-Christian. He was a journalist. And it was through his desire to try to prove that Christianity was irrelevant that he came to become a Christian because he looked at the evidence for himself. And along his journey, he decided to do something just to get a good feel for the whole of the scriptures. So he holed himself away in his mountain retreat in Colorado, and he read the Bible from beginning to end, nonstop. And he was shocked by what he discovered, and what he realized is that the Bible is actually one long story that's a love story. It's a story of God's effort to try to reach out to humanity, to pull us in, to make us his people. And sometimes we respond, and other times we turn our backs and take for granted who we are. And he was amazed at how often God is humiliated. And he asked why would he subject himself to that kind of rejection over and over and over. But he does because he loves us. And so put whatever you're reading in that larger context. I had a professor in seminary that used to say to us, the Bible is not so much a model for morality as it is a mirror of identity. The Bible is not so much a model for morality as much as it is a mirror of identity. There's certainly morality to be found in it, but it's best understood when we look for ourselves within the story. And identify with the characters because you'll discover quickly that these people are not perfect. It's amazing that they allow their story to be told so honestly. And so it's so easy to see ourselves in it. So I recommend when you turn the scriptures, try four questions. Michael Novelli offered these to, to us. He says, use your imagination and just look first for what you notice. See what jumps out at you. And then secondly, ask that deep question, even if it's hard for that passage to fit our modern scientific mind, just to ask, why would the Israelites or those first Christians tell the story? There must be a reason it's there, so there's a reason for us. And then look for yourself in that story. What does the story say about us, about humanity? And finally, what does it say about God and how he chooses to interact with us in humanity? Okay, 
my favorite scripture. And let me share this and let you know that you're welcome to have your own favorites. I'm not trying to push mine on yours, but I've discovered that when we learn people's favorite scriptures, we learn something about them. And maybe you did earlier when we shared with each other. But if I had to pick, and it's a tough choice, and sometimes it depends on where I'm at at a given time in my life and what I'm going through, but I would start out and say that my favorite book of the Bible, because it's got to be about Jesus, is the book of Mark. And I know a lot of people like the Gospel of John, and that's fine. But I like Mark partly because I'm an action kind of person. If you read the Gospel of Mark, you notice there's this word that pops up over and over, immediately, immediately. It's all action. There's nothing, it's the shortest gospel. And, and that's just how I am. I'm one of those guys, you go to the museum, and Nancy's with me, and I'm always ahead of her. Just ask her. She has to read every little word, and I quickly grasp what I'm interested in, and I move on. And that's sometimes how I approach the scriptures. And Mark is that action kind of gospel. But I think I like it best because I feel like it comes closest to capturing the raw personality of Jesus. We believe that the Gospel of Mark is a series of oral sermons that have been collected. And so it's best to be heard with your ears than read with your eyes. I had a professor, Mark Van Bogard Dunn, who memorized the entire Gospel of Mark, the entire Gospel. And each year we'd have a convocation near the beginning of the school year, and we'd gather people around, and he would recite from memory the first half of the Gospel of Mark, we'd take the intermission, and then he'd share the second half of the Gospel of Mark. And he was right. You would hear things that you just didn't notice when you read because it was intended to be heard first. That was the origin of it. So that would probably be my favorite book, the Bible. But if you're going to ask me my favorite chapter of the Bible, and it's a tough one because I think I'd want to gravitate towards Jesus but I found in my ministry that when people come to me and say, give me a passage that helps me with this, I turn to Romans 8 over and over again. If somebody's dealing with sin, I share this chapter because you'll find in verse 1, so now there isn't any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if they keep on reading, they're going to come across 15 through 17. that talks about us being adopted, and now we're considered family that we can call God Abba, which is the most intimate form of father. It's like saying dad or daddy. If somebody's struggling with prayer, then we can turn to the 26th verse of Romans. And it shares the most, would you read that with me? In the same way the Spirit comes to help our weakness, we don't know what we should pray, but the Spirit himself pleads our case with unexpressed groans. What a beautiful passage. You've had those times when you're so overwhelmed with emotion, you can't even speak, you can't even think. All you got to do is lean your heart toward God and the Spirit prays for you. Or if you're going through suffering, which all of us are bound to do at some point in our life, in this chapter you find wonderful verses that speak that suffering isn't going to last forever. I believe that the present suffering is nothing compared to the coming glory that is going to be revealed to us. So what are we going to say about these things? If God is for us, who's against us? What can separate us from the love of Christ's love? Will it be separated by trouble or distress or har harassment or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And it keeps on going. Beautiful verses. And so if you're going to tie me down and force me to say, what is my favorite verse? I know many of us would say John 3.16, right? And that's a good one. But I like this one because it's been so true for my life. Over and over again, we know that God works all things together for good, the ones who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Over and over again in my life, and you know, and I've had many negative things happen in my life. Just last Sunday, I talked about the struggle of living with a mother who has mental illness. And yet God has used that. He used it even just last Sunday. Someone came to my office this week and shared that they felt God speaking to them when they heard that story and realized it, a connection in their own life that they hadn't put together before. 
God takes those negative experiences. When I went through my divorce, it was such a difficult time in my life. There was times that I had to get up and preach when I had not slept a wink because I was so upset about what was happening in my personal life. And yet somehow God would get me through it. I literally felt God holding me up. And I realized that, you know, I've preached grace forever, but now I really understand what grace is like because I experienced it firsthand. And how many times in our lives have we found ourselves just at the right place at the right time? That somehow God, without controlling everything, somehow brings things together to achieve his purposes. So this verse just rings true over and over again. And I share it with people in so many places and so many times. I hope that you allow yourselves to enter into the scriptures, to hear them as sacred story, so that you will find your favorite verse and your favorite chapter, and your favorite book, because if you do, then that sacred story has a chance to shape your personal story and make you the person that God desires you to be. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you for these holy scriptures. Sometimes they're hard to understand. Sometimes we get bogged down and get so confused, but help us just to focus and look at the big picture, to look for that sacred story that needs to be spoken to us in our place and our time in that moment. And then may we be prepared to share that with others in the right place, in the right time. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. Amen.